live from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Q, covering Structure 2015. Hey, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are live at the Julia Morgan Ballroom in downtown San Francisco at kind of Structure Reborn, Structure 2015. Come back to life after uh, the one got canceled this summer, so we're really happy to be here. We're kind of wrapping up day one. I'm here with George Gilbert uh, from Wikibon. So George, impressions of the day. You know, um, I'm reminded of that scene in the original Indiana Jones movie where they're um, digging you know, from the surface of the desert all the way down you know, into this hole, and they're passing all these levels of strata. And I know strata is a dirty word because it comes from the competition, but basically we're seeing many layers of technology that we saw, that we've talked to uh, vendors representing those layers. Um, the last one, Intel, was talking about how what used to be hardwired infrastructure in terms of x86 servers, storage, networking is now much more fluid um, in the sense that just the way uh, we had um, virtualization for servers, we're now seeing that same capability on networking and on storage, and so everything in the data center becomes programmable. That's the lowest la layer of, of the strata. Um, we talked really at, at the highest layer with um, Joseph Shirosh, um, of Microsoft where you know you don't even know where his stuff is running it's out in the cloud somewhere but he's got this really deeply integrated data lake that doesn't bear any real resemblance other than the programming interface to this Hadoop data lake that we all hear about this one is industrial strength it runs as a service you know, you don't need 47 different administrators taking care of 17 different corners of it. And then they've got a whole lot of analytics that layers on top of it seamlessly. So top to bottom, we saw a lot. So one of the core themes is always best of breed versus an integrated solution. And for best of breed, you might get better capabilities on a particular um, silo of functionality, but now you've got an additional layer of overhead and an right. additional layer of management go with an integrated stack, in theory everything works really well, so maybe you don't have the best, the best of breed on a particular thing. How's that really changing now in the cloud world? Because we have kind of two things going on. Cloud's all about elasticity, and being able to, to expand and contract, but you can't do that at scale without a tremendous amount of automation. And the other piece we talked to, um, about APIs, and now all this stuff is interconnected. It's not just a single app and you control. So how are those trends being utilized? How are we using more horsepower to enable elasticity, more best of breed, API integration, as well as, as automating so much of the, of, the, of the configuration and the expansion? Okay, so maybe an analogy works here. Picture uh, the cockpit of an airplane. You've got 47,000 knobs you can turn. That's sort of how big data is dealt with today. Um, whether on-premise or, or even in the cloud, you've got to know, you've got, you've got to have you know, storage guides, you've, you've got to have zookeeper guides, and I don't mean you know, the ones you know, keeping animals. I, I'm talking about all these different servers that have to interact, and they all have these different behaviors and administration and programming interfaces, so, but they're tunable so you can get just what you want. But the opposite of that, which you um, mentioned, is integrate it all for me. And I might just not turn get, on the autopilot, right? Yes, turn <laughs> on the autopilot. You know, I don't want to bother with these knobs. I just want to get where I'm going. And I think it's not, there's not one right or wrong answer, but the early adopters have the skills and the inclination to tune. So like an Uber, you know, they might not want all, you know, all you can eat of, you know, one blanket interface, but when you get to, you know, a mid-sized enterprise, they don't have 67 administrators to handle a Hadoop cluster. Yeah, and, and it was interesting, um, Jonathan talked about, because there are no single vendor customers, right? It, right? it doesn't exist. But George, talk about, you know, kind of how we've got so much more compute horsepower now and how that can really be brought to bear to start to automate 
uh, at scale the tuning of those knobs where maybe before you just really couldn't do it. But Moore's Law continues to chug along right. with all the gusto uh, that it's had before and we just have such massive scale of compute, store, and now software-defined networking that is really enabling a level of automation that you just couldn't do. You don't need uh, an army of pilots uh, to use your analogy like <laughs> you used to. <laughs> well, um, I guess one way of thinking about it is the m machine learning is sort of the new, uh, the new black, you know, like um, as in the, the, the new it um, color. And um, you can use machine learning to get a sense for how your network and how your data center and how your software should behave. This is still a bit of a science project, but um, rather than having people track down, you know, uh, a, like um, in a hospital, you know, s s the 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 monitors that go that go off when you know someone's heart stops. You know, you got to go figure out what happened. Here, um, these things get a sense for the rhythms, and when things aren't operating quite right, it'll alert someone before the heart stops. Right, right. That's the idea. But what's interesting is because the whole kind of idea of you throw everything into a data lake and the answers magically appear, right? We know that just doesn't, it just doesn't work that right. way. But the other thing is we were talking to Google at the Women in Data Science Summit at Stanford a couple of weeks back, and even the, with the resources of Google, um, if you don't have some type of hypothesis, some type of guidance, some type of direction in which to target your resources, even they can spend an inordinate amount of time doing things that if you had at least set a direction, you would be there. And even with the massive, both compute and dollar resources that Google have, they don't go on these kind of throw it in there and let's see what comes out. There's always kind of a, a thought, there's an agenda, there's a process in following it uh, down a path because there's also this value piece of the equation, right? In theory, if infinite compute and infinite money, yeah, sure, but that's not the world in which we live, right? I it's got to tie back to a value. You're making like a, the most important point, which is you have to start with a question, you know, because you, you have to reason, you have to test well, is this, you know, is this condition started by this, you know, question that you're asking? Otherwise, you're, it's open-ended and, you, you know, you would never, you wouldn't know where to start and you wouldn't know where to end. Right, so biggest surprise today? Um, biggest surprise, I guess, understanding more and more how, how much there's a disconnect between the public perception of what big data means, which is still very much Hadoop, and what the cloud vendors are doing, which is very much proprietary services that integrate deeply with one another so that they're simple to operate and simple to build applications for. That is a huge disconnect. But, but hasn't there always been a historical kind of knock on Hadoop, just in terms of resources, just the amount of, of people that know how to operate the system? But you got to remember, yes, except that it started at a company where they had you know, more rocket scientists than NASA. When the guys had invented it too, it, right? Yeah, at Google. <laughs> it was, you know, more, so more rocket scientists than NASA. And then you know, to, to Yahoo, which sort of implemented it in a shareable way. And for the most part, it's been adopted by organizations that do have a, a surplus of these very sophisticated skills. It has not made it into the mainstream. Right. And what we're hearing from these cloud vendors is they know it, they're not saying it, but they're preparing offerings for people who need something simpler. Which, which may or may not be powered by Hadoop right. on the back end, right. but it's, it always goes back to solutions, right? It's solutions and applications, right. solving real problems. Right. What are you looking forward to tomorrow? We got day two. Uh, we got day two on tap. Oh, besides getting a good night's sleep tonight, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, let's see. Uh, I'm looking forward to more application stories. Um, like now that we have so much more data, so how do you think? Re how do you resync applications? You know, in a world of, of huge amount of data, and and also when the data is coming from sort of the edge of the network and you're capturing it and analyzing it closer to the edge of the network. You know, that would be, that would be a, a, a sort of another big thing to think about. The Intel, the Intel sort of, the last interview we did with Intel about sort of programmable infrastructure, I don't think we're going to hear anyone better 
are, are, you know, who can articulate better, you know, what's going on in the data center um, than them. So I think that sort of the next layers up will be where we, we get some more insight. X86, the gift that keeps on giving, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, George Gilbert from Wikibon, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We are live at the Julie Morgan Ballroom, day one of Structure. We'll be back next day, all day wall to wall, so tune in, uh, catch all the interviews, and uh, this is Jeff Frick signing off from the Julie Morgan Ballroom. Thanks for watching. <laughs>